Testing, one, two, three. Hopefully we're working. And we'll get going here in a second. Let me just bring up my computer to make sure everything's working all right. All right. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me. Keep my fingers crossed at least. If you, uh, if you guys can hear me, please go ahead and let me know. I will go ahead and bring up the slides we're going to cover today. And we'll get started in just a minute. Oh, good. It looks like somebody's here. That's good. And the other slides, there we go, all right. Okay, looks like we're ready to get started here. Let me bring up the slides we're gonna cover. Make sure that's all working properly. All right. So welcome to the ninth live lecture and virtual office hours. Actually, it's not a virtual office hours yet. It's just the ninth uh, live lecture for the POSA communication MOOC. What we're going to be covering today will be the long-awaited command processor pattern discussion. We didn't get to it last time because we were spending the time focusing instead on topics related to the assignment number two walkthrough. So, but we'll cover that today. And of course, we'll also take any, any questions you might have about the assignments or other things along those lines. So let's go ahead and see if we can share my screen. There's the presentation I want to display. Let's bring it up for you. OK. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start first by talking about the command processor pattern from the point of view of what is the pattern, what's its intent, its applicability, its structure and functionality, and then we'll talk about how it's applied in Android. So this pattern is a pattern that appears in a, a couple of different places. There's a, a version of it that appears in the POSA 1 book. There's also a a subset of this pattern called the command pattern that appears in the Gang 4 book. And then there's also a paper called the Command Revisited, which tries to unify the other papers. And so we'll start by kind of motivating the need for this pattern. So as you've undoubtedly noticed by now, if you have synchronous method calls in an activity that uh, block for extended periods of time, this can be a problem. So for example, if we were trying to uh, hold on a second. The slides are not shared. Let's try that again. Okay, that's weird. Sorry about that. Let's back up. Okay, let's see. That hopefully is looking better. All right, so we're going to be talking about the command processor pattern today, and uh, we will see a couple of examples of how this pattern gets applied. Hopefully you can see the slides up there now. So the command processor pattern gives you a way of being able to separate the command from the context in which the command will execute. And the pattern is actually defined in, in several different uh, places. It's defined in the Gang of Four book, it's something called the command pattern, which is sort of a subset of what we'll be covering here. It's defined in the Post of One book in as the command processor pattern and then there's a paper that appeared that you can download which i'll give a link to shortly uh, 
that tries to unify the two different descriptions. And we provide the pattern description here in the context of, of both of, uh, of all these different resources. So let's start by talking about the motivation for the pattern. So as you know, if you have synchronous method calls that access external resources, like downloading a file uh, or an image from the network, those could block from, for an extended period of time. So just as an example, if you had an activity and it tried to call the download image method that's in the utils directory and most of the assignments and examples we've been using, that would block download ac activity for the duration of which the image download was taking place. And, and those blocking two-way calls, as you know, can cause problems because if the activity doesn't do something within, say, three to five seconds, then the dreaded application not responding or ANR dialog pops up and the application tries to uh, get you to shut it down. So these are some of the, the issues. Um, basically, anytime you do a call that could block for an extended period of time, that could cause, could cause trouble. So the solution is rather than trying to do things as, as two-way calls that can block, instead you encapsula, encapsulate your work request, in this case it's a download image request, but it could be more generally be anything that might block. And you make that an intent, you make the request an intent, and as you all know, you can put extras and other things in the intent. And then the activity can make a non-blocking call, like a start service call, passing the intent in. And this intent then gets passed from a download activity to a download service, like a download intent service, which will process the intent asynchronously with respect to the caller. Now, this could either run in a separate process or it could run in a separate thread. That's really a configuration time decision. And uh, when the results are done, they could be passed back somehow. And we've talked, of course, about many different ways you could pass things back, either by passing things back using stuff like a, a uh, messenger, or uh, there's other means that could be used as well to do this. So this way of arranging things to, to package up the request in a command or an intent is actually a pattern from the post of one book and from this paper I mentioned. And uh, you'll also see a, a similar description in the command pattern in the Gang 4 book, although it doesn't quite go as far with respect to some of the more interesting dimensions of command processor we're going to cover, like multiple threads or multiple processes and so on. The intent of this pattern is to package a piece of application functionality and to parameterize it into an object so it can be usable in a different context, which could be at a different point in time if you're going to queue this stuff up and run it later, or if you're going to put it on some kind of a, an undo, redo queue. It could be in a different process, a different thread, et cetera, et cetera. This paper has more information about the revised version of the command revisited pattern description. So when should you apply this pattern? What's the motivation, or not so much what's the motivation, but what's the applicability when you should think about using this pattern? Well, one time you should use this pattern is when you need to decouple the decision about what piece of code to execute, in other words, what the functionality is, from when the execution should take place, and really when and where the execution should take place. So it's not just when, it's also where. And so you might want to specify things to run at a later point in time or in a different context and so on. You might also want to be able to use this pattern when you want enhancements to services to be localized so they don't break existing code. So you don't have to change a lot of the server implementation just because you change what the command does. And you might also do this when you have certain capabilities that have to be implemented for all requests to a service. So things might include undo, redo, persistence, uh, fault tolerance, other kinds of stuff like that. So you want to kind of separate out the logic from the non-functional properties that surround the context in which the logic is going to execute. So if you if you have those needs, then here's one useful way to structure the design. So this is kind of a picture that illustrates the pattern uh, roles and responsibilities. So you have a command, and that's the thing that's going to be executed in the context of our example we'll be using here from the Android intent service, the command would be represented as an intent. Although notice that 
the particular way this works is sort of a variant of the command processor pattern because we don't actually have an execute method in an intent, although it, the way it's used here is clearly a, a command-oriented approach. It isn't quite exactly what's in the canonical version of the pattern, but that's okay because patterns can have many different implementations. So you also, of course, have to provide conc a concrete command where you add additional information above and beyond just sort of the basic level of, of capability. So in this case, in the case of something like the, the intent service, that would be extras that could be passed with the intent as additional data that's bundled and parceled into the intent. Uh, if you were thinking back to the, the hammer framework example we used for the command processor pattern in an earlier uh, MOOC, the, early, the previous MOOC, in that case, this was handled by having a runnable that you would subclass, and the runnable would have a method called execute, or called run, rather, and then you could provide additional information by subclassing runnable and then filling in additional fields. So there's a couple of different ways to do this. Then you need to have a creator, which is the thing that makes the command, and that could be a variety of things. It could be either an activity that makes the command or it could be a service that makes the command. In general, it's going to be some kind of factory method that'll make the command. If you've looked at a lot of the examples we've used here in class, you'll see that we often use the, the, uh, the mechanism of having a factory method that's implemented in the service. But that's just a particular EDM that I like to follow because it centralizes all the knowledge about how things get created. You don't have to do it that way. Then we have an executor. This is the thing that actually goes ahead and runs the command. And in our case, for the intent service, of course, that is the intent service itself. That's going to take the intent it receives as a command, and it's going to execute it. And that execution is going to take place in a particular context. And the context, of course, that will be executed in the context of, of the intent service is going to be the background thread, the one and only background thread that will be running with, uh, with the way in which things work in the intent service. There's only one request that runs at a time. So keep in mind here, we're focusing on the intent service as the example of the command processor. If you want to see the command processor described from the point of view of the Android Hammer framework and things like, say, run on UI thread, go back and watch the previous discussion of the command processor pattern from the previous POSA move. Here's how some of the dynamics work. This is kind of a, a more uh, interactive perspective than a structural perspective. So the creator, which is either the, the service itself or the activity, will create the intent and then call, um, it doesn't call send service, it calls start service. Let me go fix that. That's too egregious to leave in the slides. Let's go fix that up. Should be start service. That makes a lot more sense. All right. So that's what the creator does. The executor then will take the intent that comes to it from that was passed by the creator by say calling start service, and that goes ahead and pulls off the the uh, intent from the incoming queue of work using the start command on start command method that's implemented in the intent service and then that turns around and uses some magic to use the underlying hammer framework to pass the intent to the one and only background thread where it is then executed in the on handle intent hook method in the context of the background thread and that goes ahead and processes the intent so there's a number of consequences of using this pattern. Uh, one of the most important things, of course, is that the client is not blocked for the duration of the command processing. That's kind of what motivated our discussion in the first place. So the caller doesn't block. You could also allow different users to work with the service in different ways based on the commands that are passed to the command processor. So here's a very simple example that doesn't reflect what we talked about in, in some of our case studies, but you could easily do this yourself if you wanted to. Uh, you could have on handle intent, which is the callback in the intent service. You could have that take a look at the information that was passed over in the intent. And you could 
provide different implementations based on the data that came with the command. So in this particular case, if there's a messenger that's attached, we could go ahead and download the uh, image and then reply via the messenger. Otherwise, we could use some kind of a broadcast approach where we download the file and then we use a broadcast uh, intent to broadcast back to anybody who happens to be interested in knowing that downloads have occurred. So there's just different ways of being able to keep the same implementation and, and mix and match it based on the data that they have. There are some downsides. You have to handle the data passed with the commands. Uh, that's something that you, you have to be responsible for processing. These things are coming in as, as a message, so you'll have to write various methods that manage these, these me messages and so on. And this is not a hard thing to do if you have a very simple protocol for communicating information in messages. But if you start getting very complicated protocols, then there's a lot of programming you have to do. To, to do the command processor. So in that case, you might consider using the broker pattern instead, which we'll talk about in the next, the next live lecture. So this can kind of be tedious to handle all this, this data manually. Another tricky issue, of course, is that if you want two-way operations where you're going to send results back to the invoker, then there's additional programming effort. The command processor pattern really is focusing largely on one-way flow of information from sender to receiver. And if you want a two-way flow, then you've got some additional work to do. It's not that it's impossible, it just requires some additional work. Uh, you can see here is an example where our messenger download method will download the file and then make a message and then send the message back to the sender in order to get the results back. And that's very consistent with what things that you did for, say, assignment number one. There's lots of known uses of this pattern. Obviously, the Android Intent Service is what we've been focusing on. The uh, Java runnable interface and the uh, mechanisms that are used in the uh, the Hammer the Hammer framework. I guess I should mention that too. Let me do that before I forget. So we could say Android Intent Service, Android Hammer framework. That, that, of course, as you recall, is what's used when you're doing communication between uh, messages and, and runnables and handlers. And uh, then there's also lots of other examples that are discussed in the Gang 4 book having to do with user interface toolkits that pass commands around to do various things. Lots of Java stuff works this way. Interpreters for command line shells often use commands and so on and so forth. So to summarize this first discussion, Command processor gives you a pretty straightforward way for passing commands asynchronously between threads or processes in either concurrent and or networked software. And one of the nice things about using this programming model, this uh, communication model, is you don't have to have the requests and responses proceed in lockstep. You can send a couple of requests, some responses can come back, you can send more requests. It's very fluid and interactive and it's not driven by a lockstep uh, send response kind of uh, request response kind of paradigm. The command processor is basically a coordinator of component functionality. And therefore, the clients and the component, i.e. the thing that does the work, are freed from having to organize all the steps of executing the component's commands. In the, con in the appropriate context. It kind of breaks that, that link and chain. So that allows things to be done in a much more flexible way. So you end up with a lot more looser coupling between clients and components, which is one reason why this pattern is very popular. And if you think about what Android's doing with the intent framework in the first place, intents are, are really a, a command-oriented approach. Even though there's no execute method on an intent, you package the data that you want and some instruction, the action that you want done, and then you can send it, and that becomes a command that can be processed. So that gives you very loose coupling. So Android really, in some sense, is based around a very command processor-oriented view of uh, component integration. Okay, so that basically uh, finishes our first set of discussions. This is just giving you an overview of the pattern in general. And uh, let's go ahead and take a few questions. Uh, one question which I talked about during the video was, is run on UI thread 
an example of the command processor pattern? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, if you go back and watch the command processor video from the POSA concurrency MOOC, you'll see that we use the, uh, the hammer framework and its POST mechanisms, which run on UI thread is just a simple wrapper around POST, which you'll learn if you watch the videos from the first MOOC. That, that is also the command processor pattern, yes. Uh, next question, does the async task use the command processor pattern as well? Well, um, yes and no. So the abstraction that is offered to the user with async task is distinctly not command processor. The user abstraction you get is essentially a template method pattern, and uh, you basically inherit from the async task base class, and then you call the execute method, which is sort of the template method, and it goes ahead and calls back the various hook methods or primitive operations, as the pattern calls them, that get run in either the UI thread or the background thread. So that, that's really the template method pattern with concurrent execution is really the key overall pattern you get with async task. If you dip inside the implementation of async task, you will see that under the hood, there's a couple of things going on there which do in fact use the command processor pattern. So what's happening under the hood is that when you call the execute method, that is ultimately creating a, a, a command which is then executed in a thread that's part of the executor framework that Android provides. And so you're calling the execute method which will go ahead and, and run, it'll take the runnable and we'll go ahead and make that execute in a background thread. So that is, in fact, the command processor pattern, but it's an implementation detail. And then there's also the active object pattern that's used to send results back from the, uh, the background thread, either on the on progress update calls or when the results are finished and you need to have on post execute called back. Now the way, if you go back and watch the video about async task from the last MOOC, you'll see that there's actually a pattern called the half sync, half async pattern. And that's really the, the way it's best to think about the structure of the async task framework. So it's kind of half sync, half async with command processor and active object sort of thrown in there uh, as part of the half sync, half async implementation. But that's not really what's exposed to the application developer. The application developer uh, works at a different level. Okay, uh, let's see. So another question in AIGL, does the service always execute each method call and request in a separate thread? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, this was discussed at length in the video that we covered a week or so ago. So I will instruct you to go back and watch the video that was entitled something like Android Interface Definition Language and Binder Framework Part Two. So please go back and rewatch that video. You will find out that it does not necessarily run things in a separate thread at all. So uh, I've already covered that, so I'm not going to cover that again, but go back and watch that video and you can find out all you need to know about it. Uh, let's see. The command processor pattern, which participant makes sure that the command is executed in a different thread. I'm not quite sure how to parse your question, but it's basically the the executor is the one that figures out what thread the, the uh, command gets executed in, what, what context. The executor works together with the execution context to figure out how to get the command to run in the proper context. So that's how things work in the pattern. In the implementation in the Android intent service, of course, it's the intent service framework that figures this out. And if you go back and watch the video that talks about the intent service framework, or you wait uh, five minutes, because we're about to recover that here in a second, you'll see exactly how that works and, and what the flow of control is. Um, and the same thing sort of works with the hammer framework when it implements the command processor pattern. In which situation should we use the active object? In which situation should we use the command processor pattern? So uh, those topics were covered at length. If you go back and watch the material from the POSA concurrency MOOC, we had a number of videos that talked about the, the Android Hammer framework. And there's a tremendous amount of discussion in those videos about the difference between posting runnables and sending and handling 
uh, messages. And those are a pretty good way of distinguishing between the active object pattern and the command processor pattern. So I will refer you back to those videos. Uh, uh, the Cliff Notes version, the short version is command processor is typically done when the sender of the request knows what needs to be done. Because in many ways, that's what you encapsulate there. Now, that's one of the things that makes the, the um, Android intent service a little bit different from, say, the Hammer framework, because it's not all encapsulated in just the sender's side of things. There's actually some receiver logic that goes on there as well. Um, one of the other things is that with, with typically with active object pattern, the way that works is that you're going to um, have the receiver also heavily involved in the decision making about what gets done. And active objects are sort of inherently designed for two-way communication. It's sort of built into the whole model uh, of being able to reply back to stuff. And so if you take a look, for example, at the way in which you can send messages versus uh, via the hammer framework, you'll see that there's a, a reply to field in a message. You, you can actually stick the, the reply messenger into the message that's sent. And then when the receiver gets it, and it's uh, in its handle message method, it can go ahead and do a, a reply to operation to go ahead and send the result back. So go back and watch the videos on the Android Hammer framework, and you'll see a big, big discussion about all this stuff. Uh, let's see. What are the tips for helping determine in which context the code should run? Well, so. Uh, Obviously, if you need to have something that's going to block for a long period of time, you've got to have it run in a thread context of some kind, right? So if it's going to be a blocking operation, then it needs to run in a separate thread. As to whether it needs to run in a separate process or not, uh, again, I, I would encourage you to go back and watch some of the earlier videos that talk about when you would run a service in a background process. And there's a discussion, if you take a look, I think it's the videos that talk about the uh, bound and started services. It talks about running processes in the background, running uh, services in a background process. And if you recall, there were several things to consider. Do you want other applications to be able to share this uh, service? Do you want to be able to make garbage collection only affect one process at a time? And do you also want to isolate the client the client component from any problems that may go may occur if the service goes berserk or the command processing goes berserk. So again, you know, for these kind of questions, you really need to go back and watch the other videos. I'm just giving you pointers back to that material. We covered this stuff at length before, so make sure that you're you're going back and learning that stuff. Uh, let's see. I think we've almost got all the questions. Uh, someone has a question about peer evaluation for assignment two. Someone submitted three Java files, which were just the skeleton code. Uh, so uh, I would mark off for that. It was probably an accident, and I'm sure someone didn't intentionally just upload code that didn't do anything useful. That usually happens when people get confused and they, they upload the skeleton as opposed to their implementation. Honestly, not quite sure how that happens, but it does happen from time to time. So, uh, you know, use your judgment there. It, the code compiles, but obviously it doesn't run correctly. And obviously it also doesn't uh, implement the, those behavior correctly with respect to what the assignment was about. So perhaps giving them partial credit on the assumption that they just made a mistake is, is okay. Okay, so let us now go back to lecture mode. And we will talk about the next set of material. Go ahead and share my slides and make sure they actually share this time. All right, looks like they're showing up. Good. What we're going to do now is we're going to continue our discussion of the command processor pattern, and we're going to talk about how you can apply this to Android. Keep in mind, again, that if you want to see the Hammer Framework rendition of command processor, go back and watch the earlier video and the previous MOOC. And uh, if you want to learn the one for async, the asynchronous processing in, in the intent service, that's what we're going to cover now. So we're going to talk about the implementation steps. The first thing to do, 
Of course, if you implement this pattern, is to find the classes for the command execution that the executor will use to run and process the commands. There's a couple different ways this works. If you take a look in the Android intent service, uh, you'll see that there's a couple pieces. There's the intent code, of course, intent.java, which you can download from the uh, Android website. And uh, this, of course, is going to, to implement uh, the way in which you pass data from the activity to the service. Now, if you're really doing the real full-blown pattern, you need to define an execute operation if you can localize the processing to one method. The intent service, of course, doesn't have an execute method. Instead, what it has is it has the intent service, and the intent service is going to have an on-handle intent method. But notice this doesn't come from the command itself. It's actually part of the service implementation. So that's why the Android intent service is a variant of the command processor pattern. You then need to be able to add concrete uh, state that the concrete commands are going to need during their execution. And you can do that a couple different ways. You can, you can basically, uh, in the case of the, in, the uh, say, the hammer framework version of this pattern, you would subclass from an interface like runnable. In the case of the, the uh, intent service, then you would use a slightly different mechanism. You would use the put and get methods that are defined in intent in order to pass the state and then you could also of course have some state that was on the service implementation side that extends the intent service you then go ahead and define and implement the creator this is the guy that actually does the work of of creating the command and getting it executed uh, we have a little example here from the Android contacts application, which uses a, uh, an intent service to be able to attach photographs. So here you go ahead and you say save contact intent. You make an intent via a factory method that gives the information about the content and various photos that you want to have attached. And that's the command, the factory method that creates the com intent command. And then we go ahead and pass that intent to the service via the start service call. And under the hood, of course, that uses the activity manager service that's the service in Android that, that routes intents between the various parts. So this is basically how we're going to pass the command to the executor or the executor. We then have to provide the appropriate execution context. And Android, of course, does this a couple different ways. It has something called a context which provides the runtime environment that keeps track of things like permissions and directories and other kinds of things that relate to the context. So that's one part of the, the puzzle here. And then we go ahead and we implement the executor. And the executor, as you can imagine, is going to use the intent service framework. The intent service framework extends service, as you see up here. And it has an on create method. And when that on create method gets called the first time the service starts up, that goes ahead and makes a new handler thread and starts it. You can take a look at the source. Or actually, that's not the source code. <laughs> it should be .java, not .html. Um, that, that has the actual source code. And then here is the on start command. On start is going to be called every time an intent shows up, up from start service. And that goes ahead and makes a, a message and sticks some information like the start ID and the intent into the message. And then it passes the message to the background thread via the send message call. It basically enqueues the command for subsequent processing. And then in the service handler, which runs in the background thread, this will pull the message, uh, the, the under, underlying looper framework will pull the message off the message queue and then call back the handle message method, passing in the message. And then the framework, this intent service framework, turns around and casts the object field, which we set over here to the intent. It goes ahead and sets, it casts that back to an intent and calls the on handle intent hook method. And that, of course, then goes ahead and, and does, the, does the actual work. Here's what the method looks like for the contact save service. 
uh, mechanism in, in Android, which is an intent service. And as you can see here, it basically goes ahead and saves the photo that was passed here into the appropriate contacts content provider. And it does that in the background thread because accessing the content provider with a large photo could take a little while. We don't want to block the main thread of control while that's happening. That would make the service overly unresponsive. This is just a sort of a high level view of <clears throat> those lower level steps we just talked about. This is how it's applied in Android. Basically, the attach photo activity allows applications to attach images to their contacts. And then it uses the contact save service to save, save changes to the contacts content provider. So here we have an activity which is going to make an intent to save the photo or photos. And when it calls start service, that intent is sent over to the to the service, which is an intent service. And it's on start, it's on create command gets called to create the background thread. And when the intent comes across, the on start command is called. So now we're in a different, either a different dress space or a different part of the program. We activate the service if it isn't running yet. And then as we saw before, we go ahead and uh, on start command and queues this in the service handler. And then that is pulled off, and the on-handle intent method is called to save the contact. So most of this stuff, of course, is done behind the scenes. All you have to write, or all they had to write for the Android uh, contact save service call was the on-handle intent and save contact method, which does all the work under the hood. OK, so that's basically an overview of how the command processor pattern gets used in Android with the Android intent service. As you can see, this is a slight variant of the approach you would get with, with, uh, with Android using the hammer framework. It's also a variant of the actual command processor pattern because it's sort of splitting the processing be between the client and the service, whereas other implementations of the command processor are going to put almost all the, the logic for the the command behavior in as the responsibility of the client side, such as the, the uh, hammer framework in Android. There are obviously other patterns involved here. We have activator to activate the service on demand. We have active object to pass the uh, information from the, UI, the main thread to the background thread, and so on and so forth. OK, so that is basically an overview of the command processor pattern. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to, to take them now. If people have any questions, of course, about the final programming assignment, I'd also be happy to, to take those as well. The uh, couple of things to note about the final programming assignment, I moved the due date to Thursday, not Wednesday, because I'm actually going to be out of town on on Thursday, so I won't be around to make do a virtual office hour on um, on Thursday anyway. We'll do our virtual office hour and our our discussion of my solution on Friday of this week. So uh, that's that's when I'll go over my solution, and then we have another you know, six or seven days for for peer evaluation. Um, I had some fun the other day thinking about how to do a, a cooler implementation of the the cache. And there's all kinds of different ways to implement the, the cache, by the way, of the weather data. Uh, the current solution that I'm looking at doing basically uh, uses one hash map, which keeps track of the mapping of location to, to weather data or a list of weather data. So that's the hash map's purpose. It also stores some other stuff as well, as we'll talk about. And then in addition to having a hash map, I use a scheduled executor service. A scheduled executor service is an executor service that allows you to run things uh, in the background and based on the passage of time. So the way this works is that uh, when you go ahead and insert something, you put something into this timed cache or timeout cache, as you might call it, it basically checks first to see if there's already a uh, something in the cache under that name. And if, if so, uh, it cancels the timeout we're about to talk about. If there's not, uh, and, and irrespective of whether there's something under the, there or not, under that name, we then go ahead and we, we 
create a new timeout for 10 seconds in the future. And we do that by using the scheduled executor service where you can give it a time period in the future you want something to run. And you create a runnable. And that runnable, uh, when called back, will simply go ahead and remove the element from the cache. So basically what you do is you schedule a timeout for 10 seconds from now, if, if 10 seconds is the duration. And then you schedule that to run. And then you go ahead and you insert into the cache the location and the list of, uh, of the data that you're going to be putting in the cache, as well as a future to the, to the scheduled future that was returned from the schedule operation for, for uh, the scheduled executor service. And that way, if the timeout elapses and nobody has um, used the cache, or, or even if they have used the cache, it'll go ahead and expire the data automatically. So it removes things from the cache. It's, it's a really clever solution. We'll talk about it on Friday. I'll go through it in my design. Uh, let's see, so another question. The deadline for assignment three is Friday at 5 a.m. GMT. That is correct, yes. I believe that's the right time. You better double check that, but the, the time, of course, is set in the, the assignment itself, so you can take a look and see. In the acronym application, there are two parallel objects, JSON acronym and acronym data. It's not clear why those can't be handled by one object that implements Parsable. Um, go for it. If you want to do it differently, you can do whatever you want. That, that approach worked best for what I was doing. It made the most sense to me, but there's nothing whatsoever that restricts you from doing it a different way. So if you want to do it a different way, then please, by all means, do it a different way. Uh, we're not trying to restrict your creativity. I, I find it easier to kind of parse the stuff out first and uh, then take the results of the parse and then build whatever object I want later that just seemed cleaner to me. But if you don't like to do it that way, please uh, don't feel like you should be constrained to do it the way that we do it. Okay, well, I think that's about the questions that we had this time. If, uh, if you run into any other, other issues, of course, please feel free to post them on the discussion forum. Uh, some people seem to be joining things a bit late. And so a lot of the questions have already been answered. We're just giving you pointers back to where they were discussed already. Uh, it's a good idea, of course, to try to keep up with the discussion forum because a lot of these things get discussed. And uh, so you can, you can uh, you know, try to figure out how you can engage so you know what's going on. Um, oh, somebody pointed out they don't want to make such a complicated thing for the cache. There's lots and lots of different ways to implement the cache. So, uh, when I give out these suggestions, it's purely just to give people some tips and pointers. Do not feel obligated to do them like that if you don't feel like you want to. Um, is it not easier to handle caches on the client side rather than the services side? No. Uh, my solution could work identically in either case. You could either put it on the client or you could put it in the service. Would not matter in the least. Um, we'll see when we talk about the uh, for the next MOOC, the first assignment for the next MOOC is going to involve the use of, of content providers and SQLite. And so you could actually, if you were so inclined using a content provider, you could actually build a cache that would be blissfully unaware of whether or not it was being accessed from one process or multiple processes. So we're just going through all the different variations here. The key point is that coming up with the logic for doing the cache should really be independent of how you configure that logic into any particular process deployment of your solution. So whether it runs in the client, whether it runs in, in a process with multiple services, whether it runs in a single content provider shared by multiple services running in multiple processes, all those things really shouldn't matter very much. And uh, so you should be able to, to uh, you know, take your implementation and rearrange it with very little modification to the code. There may be subtle tweaks here or there for a few things, but it shouldn't be very much. Uh, another question, when is the period for evaluation for assignment three? Questions like that can trivially be answered by going to the assignment description where all that information is provided. So please go take a look there. You'll see that they're always pretty much identical. 
it's, it's usually a week after the due date. In this case, it'll be one day less than a week after the due date because we're moving the due date back by one day. But uh, that kind of information is all available on the website. Uh, let's see. My assignment three uses Google Play location service. Do you think that will be a problem for peers to run it? Uh, well, as a usual rule, I would discourage using anything that's a third party library that doesn't come configured out of the box with the vanilla versions of Android we've been using. So if people are able to use Google Play location service from just a stock Android implementation, uh, without having to go and install, say, all the Google APIs, which were optional and not mandatory, or without having to install other third-party libraries, then it's fine. Anything that kind of comes built into Android is fine. I would discourage you from doing something more complicated because if the peers have to install a bunch of new software, that could uh, peer evaluators have to install new software, that may irritate them. So uh, as a general rule of thumb, not irritating the, the peer reviewers is probably a good idea. Having said that, of course, I think it sounds like a really cool uh, enhancement that you've added. Uh, and I'm, I'm guessing that maybe you did that so you could get a better feeling for where the cities are located. I'm not quite sure. But um, for the next programming MOOC, the next MOOC, the mobile cloud programming MOOC that we're going to do, we're going to allow the use of a wider variety of libraries. We'll be using things like retrofit and, and other stuff. So that might be another context in which you could go back and, and use your cool implementation. Uh, we're, we're doing this incrementally because we don't want to tax people too much without giving them proper explanations of where to find the instructions on how to install other services and so on. Okay, so I think that's basically all the questions for today. I will go ahead and make these into a video here shortly and post them. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to write them on the discussion forum. Otherwise, we will get together again at the end of this week on Friday for the next section. Thanks very much.